Hello and welcome to the Back to Being podcast, where I speak with experts, practitioners and everyday people about living a more healthy, active and mindful life. My name is Kareem Rushdie and I've spent over a decade learning to transform my own chronic pain and stress so I can lead a life worth living. Now I'm using what I've learned along the way, as well as the knowledge and experience of my guests to share unique perspectives that can help you do the same. Thank you for tuning in today. Today I'm chatting with pharmacist, traditional Chinese medicine practitioner and founder of Chinese herbal pantry, Shirley Chong. Shirley's father was also a traditional Chinese medicine or TCM practitioner, and she earned her stripes in his dispensary and clinic before going on to study Western pharmacy, Chinese herbal medicine and acupuncture. Shirley and I talk about some of the foundational principles of TCM, how it differs from Western medicine in its approach to diagnosing and treating ill health, and why sleeping before 11 p.m. is critical to keep your chi or life force flowing. Enjoy the conversation. Okay, Shirley, hi, and thank you so much for spending your time being with us today. And thanks for inviting me as well. And this is my first podcast ever. So if you hear me stutters or anything, you know what it's me. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. This is only my seventh or eighth podcast. So I'm still yes. pretty novice at this. We'll help each other through it. So the backstory to having Shirley on the podcast is that my wife, Rebecca, was at a dinner in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, where Shirley is originally from, although she's living in Australia now. And Shirley was talking at that dinner and Rebecca was so blown away by Shirley's presentation, the way she spoke so passionately about traditional Chinese medicine, made it really accessible and easy to understand that she came back and she said, Kareem, we've got to get Shirley on the podcast. So we're so happy that you accepted our invitation. I think it's meant to be because on that day when I spoke with Rebecca, she's supposed to move to England, like almost the next day. And then I'm about to come back to Australia just a day after. So I feel very fortunate and grateful for the connections that we formed. So I think it's meant to be. Yeah, no no coincidences. So before we talk a bit more, you know, I want to ask you all about what traditional Chinese medicine is, how it differs from Western medicine for all those listeners who might not be too familiar. And then we'll get into, you know, pain and inflammation and things like that later. But before we go there, you have a very interesting background, traditional Chinese medicine, Western pharmacy training back to traditional Chinese medicine. Could you share a little bit about your origin story and how you came to be here and doing what you're doing today? Yeah. So what happened is I literally born into the TCM family. TCM means traditional Chinese medicine. Hmm. So when I born, my dad is already a, a TCM practitioner. So he already owned his shop. He already have his own clinic, herbal dispensary. So I literally kind of grew up in that kind of environment. So even in my YouTube channel, the name is Chinese Herbal Pantry, but sometimes I joke that my mom's pantry literally is the whole of my dad herbal dispensary. Mm -hmm. She would just go and pick up herbs that she wants and then just bring it back to the kitchen to cook. So every meal was, every meal was medicinal. Not every, but (laughs) sometimes I think the kids are tired of it. So yeah, but it reminded me recently, I went back to Malaysia due to the pandemic, I couldn't go back for three yeah, so recently when I went back and that's what my mom gave it to me, I'm like, oh my God, it, it reminds me of my childhood and it's still the same. So, yeah, so that's how I was brought up. And then later on when I finished my high school and initially I was hoping to study like more creative area, like filmmaking, mass media and stuff, but it was like a negotiation with my dad, I must go into healthcare. So, wow. <laughs> and like- yeah, yeah. I think a lot of Asian family can relate that. He always hoped that I'll get a Western medicine or Western medicine related degree. So he has a dream that eventually once I graduated, I would go back to Malaysia and help him to build this integrative medicine where he has the Chinese medicine and I will have my Western medicine. So yeah. cut the story short. Yeah, I agree. So I decided to do pharmacy. The Western medicine, I, I'm someone who very scared with blood and stuff. So <laughs> doctor was not your like, of tea. No, no, even though I have the marks to go in, I decided not to. And it's too long a commitment. <laughs> well, right. So I just thought, okay, I think three, four years pharmacy, I can do that. So I ended up studying pharmacy. And after I graduated in Australia, at that time, I was still very rebellious. So I decided to stay in Australia Mm -hmm. (laughs) and continue to do my pharmacy. And then this is the free life that I wanted to live. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I did pursue something small, like in filmmaking and stuff. But interestingly, in I think it was 2004, 
yeah, 2004, 2006, I went to China to backpack for one whole month. So I think that's where the turning point. Because prior to that, while I have a good career as a pharmacist, I also want to find something that is like my life work or the calling. Mm. And then the pharmacy, more or less, it, I love what I do in terms of helping patients and stuff. At the end, when I was in China, I saw the possibility of TCM. At that time in Australia, Chinese medicine is still not as recognized. And so I feel quite disheartened by what could I do if I have this. And then at that point, I wasn't ready to go back to Malaysia. But when I was in China, I sneaked into those major TCM hospitals. Mm. So, and I realized how possible it is that eventually, or at least one country is doing that where they can integrate Chinese medicine with Western medicine. Yeah, I mean, I was living in China for many years, and I think what people maybe don't realize, when they think of TCM, they think of small little clinics, small dispensaries, you know, family-owned businesses or individuals like you. But in China, there are... Yeah huge full-size hospitals i remember in shanghai when i was living there and often went to them i'm a big fan of tcm and you know huge state-of-the-art facilities but just for traditional chinese medicine so it really is in parallel to the western medicine in china it's just as popular right if not more yes yes speaking about china because i actually went to china for three years to leave and also further training my tcm after i decided to study so once again like you say it is possible right so it was because of that, it prompted me that I must study Chinese medicine because that's my heritage and I have mm-hmm. the advantage of the family background. And then I decided to study in Australia at that time. My dad was furious. <laughs> he said, why Australia? <laughs> you can come back or you could go to China. But I say no, I want to learn Chinese medicine in English because I am fluent in Chinese. I can read, write and speak. And I have my dad. So if I don't learn in English, how could I communicate it? How could I communicate with the world later? So that was mm, my vision. Yeah, yeah that's so, a really, really I, good point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I could go back, go to China, but my world would just limit to the Asian community where I couldn't share and spread this philosophy and healing arts. So I decided to study in Australia and I already have the Western medicine or Western pharmacy background plus my Chinese medicine. So it's a great complementary to each other. So that's how it all happened. So I decided to study in Australia. And then a few years after, I went to China to further my training. So that's kind of my journey. Mm. And when you were studying, because there's lots of different disciplines, you know, within Chinese medicine or lots of different modalities from acupuncture to, you know, cupping to the actual herbal medicines themselves. Did you focus on any specific modality? Yes, my specialty is in Chinese herb. Actually, in Australia, there are two types of training. One are the bachelor, where you get five years, you do all the study. And then there is another form, it's a master degree. So I did the master because I already have a healthcare degree behind me. So I went on to the master because you know all the Western medicine. We already have the skills being a healthcare professional. So I went into the master. So I first started with my herbs because that's where I feel most familiar with. And then much later, I decided to do acupuncture. Yeah, I would still say my specialty is still in herbs. And with my dad, that's how I was trained since young. My dad specialized in herbs too. He doesn't do acupuncture. Yeah, Yeah, really interesting. So it kind of mirrors your pharmacy training. It's just the Chinese medicine version of being a pharmacist, which is being a herbalist, right? Yeah, 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 really. Yeah, I think a lot of people, they think of TCM, they think of acupuncture first, but you'd be surprised. I mean, Karin, you live in China before. In China, the biggest thing is actually herbs. Yeah. Acupuncture is a slightly smaller department in the whole hospital. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it could even be more popular these days in some Western countries than it is in China. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So once you got the, the qualifications, you started practicing, but you've done much more than just practice. As you said earlier, you're kind of evangelizing for Chinese <laughs> herbs and how they can improve health and well-being as well. So where did you go from once you had this degree? How did you put it into practice? In Australia, basically, it's very simple in terms of once you get your qualifications, you either rent a room and then you start seeing patients privately. So I would say I started with that and then eventually... After the China experiences and then also after the pandemic experiences, especially during the pandemic, I started to feel that there is a need for people to learn how to do their self-care at home. And I feel that during that time, a lot of my friends with Asian background, 
they would call, how do I do this? How do I cook this thing? How do I do this soup, this tea? And I realized there's a big gap in terms of a professional practitioner where you see patient, you write up all these complex formula. A lot of people in everyday life, they can make those small changes. They can learn simple knowledge about Chinese herbs where you could either prevent a certain illness to happen or either help you to treat minor symptoms before you go to the Western medicine. So I think it's based on that I decided to start the YouTube channel more for friends initially because I just received too many phone calls. Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world. Yeah. And I thought I'm just going to make some video for you guys to have a look. If any question, you can let me know. And then slowly grow from there. So that's now actually become my passion, education, because at the end of the day, by the time the patient comes to the clinic to see me, sometimes I worry it's never too late. But if we can treat early, maybe it won't cool to this stage. Right. So put the whole prevention rather than cure, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I would say now that's where I would like to put a lot of effort on education and empowering with this sort of knowledge. Yeah. Right. Right. So, I mean, as the name implies Chinese Herbal Pantry, your YouTube channel and your website, it's about rather than those very complex, I've had, you know, Chinese herbalists give me medicines for various things over the years. And, you know, some of these, you get one little pouch of dust, basically, that has maybe 50, 60 different ingredients in it. But rather than going that route, there's things people can do at home. And as the name implies, pantry, we can actually integrate yeah. some of these herbs into our cooking, into our meals, into our food and drinks to improve yeah. our well-being. Yeah. Love it. Love it. So I want to get into a little bit for anyone listening that is perhaps not familiar with traditional mm. Chinese medicine. And we were talking earlier that sometimes we might take for granted, right? I mean, you've studied it. It's been your life. I've lived in China and in Asia for many years and have used TCM. But I think for many people, it's quite a foreign concept, mm -hmm. right? And maybe misunderstood or not understood at all. So let's have a little TCM 101. What are the basics of TCM? What are some of the foundational principles, the history of it, and perhaps also how it's different, you know, from Western medicine? Mm -mm. I think that's a good question where a lot of people ask and probably still get very confused. Yeah. So I think I'm going to summarize it to five points. Okay. <laughs> the first most important, most fundamental difference is the way of thinking. So when you have a different way of thinking, it affects how you look at your health, how you look at your bodies and how we look at our relationship with everything around us. And that's lead to how people resolve health issues and how medical professionals develop the treatments and how we look for solutions for health conditions. So in a nutshell, that's the main difference between TCM and Western medicine. So TCM uses circular thinking. Western medicine uses more linear thinking. So when I say circular, probably people could just imagine the yin and yang theory and the symbol because I mean, that's the basis of the whole of Chinese culture. And that's also the basis of Chinese medicine. Because yin and yang concept started off in the ancient time, those ancient people, observations of the world and how the rhythm of the universe moves and how they affect their life. Mm. And eventually, yeah, TCM borrowed that concept and used the same concept. That kind of interconnectedness of everything, but also that cyclical nature of the universe, right? Yeah, I love yes. it. Because that's what I would say. I mean, if someone asked me the difference, I'd say, well, the first word is holistic. You know, you think of TCM, yeah. it's looking at the whole rather than Western medicine tends to look at different parts of the whole and sometimes in a disconnected way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I think that's the main difference. And if you really uh, imagine, like, put the yin and yang symbol in your head. So if you think of it, there's no straight line on it. It's always right. just curved. And then if you look at the white, there is a black dot inside. If you look at the black, there is a white dot inside. So nothing can exist by its own. And there's not 50% of the yin and there's not 50% of the yang. And it's a constant changes. The yang is in the yin or the yin is in the yang. Yes, yeah. yes. And it's never alone. And it actually have to complement each other. So I think that's a very different way of looking. And... I mean, that's bring me to the other concept of what is illness, yeah? So I was curious. So I went to Wikipedia and see how they define. And I find that how they write it is quite interesting. I'm going to read it out. Yeah. Ying and Yang describe how obviously opposite or contrary forces may actually be complementary, interconnected, and interdependent in the natural world, and how they may give rise to each other as they interrelate to one another. So I think that... 
basically summarize it so there is no absolutely right or wrong. And so that's how we develop the treatment in Chinese medicine. One concept is, for example, say we're treating different disease with the same method and treating the same disease with the different method. We don't look at disease as only one way. If you have, let's say, arthritis and you can only use this sort of method, we don't do that. We actually look at the whole. It could end up two different types of disease, I will use the same method. But mm -hmm. it could be one disease, I can have a lot of methods to use. So it's back into the personalization, the holistic way of looking at health. And the other way is what is illness, right? So there is a saying in Chinese medicine, is yu bing gong tun, means that you live with your illness. You don't have to absolutely cure it. And that's part of the yin and yang as well, as in there is the black and there's white and the white within the black, the black within the white. So oh. I think that's very different from Western, where we see something we want to kill immediately, we want to absolutely kill it to feel that you are healthy. But it's not necessarily the case in Chinese medicine. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. First on the yin and yang, I mean, it's basically looking at things from a non-dualistic lens, right? Yeah, There's a lot yeah. of like dualism in, I think, the West in general and Western medicine. And then this idea that you live with your illness. I mean, illness yeah. is a part of life. Pain is a part of life. And yeah. I think we've been tricked in the Western yeah. world into thinking that we can lead yeah. pain-free lives. No one, not one person on yeah. the planet leads a pain-free life, nor an illness-free yeah. life. It's just part yeah. of the human condition. It's more about how you work with them, how you relate to those experiences. Yeah. So yeah, love it. Mm. And understand how your body works and then you find ways to resolve and slowly either work the way around or slowly train your body. But it's understanding that you don't have to absolutely get rid of your illness to be healthy. So I think that the main difference between Western and the TCM, the other two big part one is emotions. I think only quite recently Western medicine realized how emotions affect our health. The TCM, we know that thousand years ago. It's actually in another theory in the five and just catching up. <laughs> I know, finally. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, it's mm. fascinating. When I learned TCM and then when I start to connect with Western medicine, we already know that. Mm -hmm. But we probably do not know how to explain it in the more scientific way, but through observation, we already know that. So emotions are the main part. I mean, there's an old saying that except external injury. I mean, that's a very old saying because in China, when they're farmers and you have a lot of animals bites or gunshots or falling, and those are considered external energy. But apart from that, we say all internal illnesses arises from emotions. Mm -hmm. So in today's world, it's the stress, it's the anger, the sorrow and the worries and the fear that we have. And those will somehow affect the balance of the yin and yang and somehow slowly push our body to not a very balanced or harmonized way. And that's when symptoms arise. But I'm happy that Western medicine start catching up. And of course, the other one is prevention is always better than cure. I mean, we cannot deny that Western medicine already know that. But Chinese medicine, we talk a lot about the yang shen concept, how we nurture our health through everyday small effort and how to live with the universe and you don't have to go against it, how to live with the weather changes. Yeah, I think those are another two main factors that are quite different. But those are the ones that Western medicine start realizing. You often hear the distinction made in terms of, you know, uh, Western medicine treats symptoms and Chinese medicine treats root causes. So maybe it could be a condition like, I don't know, arthritis or someone comes in with a headache, you know, in a Western medicine medical context, they look at the head, they'd scan the head, they deal with the yeah. head. How would a TCM practitioner approach? I'm specializing in women's health. So one way to look at it, I mean, one is the pain. For example, a lot of people, they don't understand when they go to see a Chinese medicine doctor, if you have a pain, let's say the lower back pain, but a Chinese medicine doctor will ask a lot of questions other than the pain itself. We will look into your bowel motions. As a woman, we will look at your menstrual cycles. We will look at how you eat, what you eat, and your sleep pattern, your energy. So people will think, come on, I'm just having pain. Can't you just put the needles right on there? Yeah, yeah. just give me the medicine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why you want to go fine? Digestion. Why do you want to know my bowel motion? 
Why are you asking me to stick out my tongue and look at my tongue? <laughs> yeah. why, why are you feeling my pulse? You know, all of the things. That... That's right. That's right. But for Chinese medicine, we really look at the whole body. We want to figure out what actually is causing the pain. Yeah. So for example, there is a saying in Chinese medicine, Bu tong zi tong, means that when things are not moving or flowing freely, that's when we will cause pain. Yeah. And yeah. the the next sentence after that is Bu rong zi tong. When there's no proper nourishment, you will also feel pain. So while we know there is a pain in a particular section, but we want to know what's causing it. When it's not flowing properly, can cause pain. Yeah. But is it cold? I mean, that's Chinese medicine concept. We look at cause of illnesses, not bacterial virus or those kind of Western medicine concepts. Because Chinese medicine developed based on observation of the universe. So we look at the universe too. So there are cold, there are heat, there are dampness, there are wind. And all those are things that we think will cause the problem. So how do you define, for example, the pain? Pain can be many different types. It could be a pain that when you touch, it's actually warm on the surface. There are other pain when you touch, it's actually cold on the surface. Mm. And then your other body signs and symptoms will tell me whether this is a cold pain. I'm using a very common name here that are more complicated, but that's just one way to look at it. And then whether it's a cold pain or whether it's a warm pain. And then if it's cold, it's all about balance that and plot heat to help with that. Yeah. And your other signs and symptoms will tell me. And then apart from pain, we have the acute pain and the chronic pain. In Chinese medicine, it affects how I'm going to treat you. So let's say if it's a chronic pain, but there are acute symptoms in it, I probably have to first treat the acute before I can support what's underlying cause. So there's yeah. a lot of methods. It's almost like going to... Like when you play chess, they have to think of all these strategies. Strategies, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have to analyze that. So when I ask all these questions, that's when we go into the root cause to see first what causing it, where it comes from, and what are the strategies I need to use. Do I treat the superficial symptoms first or do I treat the underlying? And how do I make you feel better? If the superficial, I can give you a quick fix, I'll fix that now because you feel better. And then because the underlying cause might take much longer time to really fix or yeah. to find the balance. So I think that's why Chinese medicine is powerful in that way. It's very personalized. And back to the yin and yang concept, condition changes. It's not just one way. So you come to see me during summertime will be different when you come to see me during wintertime. And then your stages of illnesses will be very different from like A, B, C, D, if you come in to see me during A stages compared to coming to see me during B stages. So that's when we talked about the root cause in terms of I need to figure out where you are by asking all these questions and go deep into where this actually comes from. Yeah, but I think that's a long answer for, <laughs> for your no, 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 it's, re yeah. it, it, it's really good. When, when you talk about flow and kind of movement there and nourishment, because one of the things I recall from probably every visit to a Chinese medicine mm. doctor is that no matter what the issue you're presenting with is, and no matter what the diagnosis and the medicine that's prescribed, there'll always be something to improve circulation within the medicine. And is that related back yeah. to that flow being so important yeah. that circulation is yeah. kind of one of these foundational health matters? Yeah, absolutely. Circulation. So, I mean, there's different way to talk about circulation because while we need to ensure the flow, we also need to nourish at the same time. Mm. Yeah. So that's why the sentence that I just shared, when it's not flowing properly, when there's stagnation, there's pain. But when there's not enough nourishment, that could also cause pain. So circulation is important. Make sure that it flow. But not everybody can have those medicine at the same time. Some people who are weaker, I probably cannot push the flow. So that's when I need to come in to nourish first. When you have enough material, then I can make sure it flow. So while circulation is important, and we also need to make sure that you have the proper nourishment or the other way around. It always comes hand in hand to support each other. Interesting. So, Interesting. So you need to be strong enough to support that flow. And when we talk about yeah. circulation, is it just 
you know, we're talking about, of course, blood and lymphatic fluid and all the things that move around the body. But what about chi? I'd love to spend a moment or two talking about chi. Like, what is chi and how does that flow around the body <laughs> and out of the body? Actually, when we talk about Chinese medicine, it's all about chi rather than the Western world circulations. Because circulation gives you immediate connotation is there's this blood vessel flowing, yeah? But we talk about the chi flow. So chi is something that you cannot see. There's no blood vessels for the chi to move. And that's when we talked about the meridians. So chi basically, mm, it's some people like to use it as energy. Yes or no, while it is true, it's part of the energy perspective. It also keep moving in our body. And mm. it's the life force that we carry and it's the health that we carry. So it's a very difficult concept. A lot of people don't fully understand, but in a nutshell, sometimes when I do acupuncture, trigger a point, I will feel the needles moving. So mm. for me, that's, it's the chi, which able to trigger the chi. So it's there, but for most of us, we probably cannot pinpoint where it is, but in a way it's our life energy. Mm. It's not just the energy, whether you feel you have a good sleep, whether you can work. It's not, it's the life energy that everyone has and everyone carry. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not an easy concept. I encourage anyone to go. Yeah. If you haven't heard of Chi, go and read up about it. But they, there's also, it's kind of the equivalent of prana, right? So in Hindu mm. philosophy and in Ayurvedic medicine in India, talk a lot about prana and the pranic energy. I think it's yeah. basically the same thing. Yeah. It's our, it's our life force. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in Chinese medicine, we do trace the meridian so it's how the chi will circulate through the meridian but those meridian it's also not blood vessels and even in chinese medicine we talk about blood but not really the western medicine blood vessels so it's the understanding of the flow of things in our body are meridians the same as pressure points pressure point is the point mm -hmm. meridian is like the pathway of the chi flow the lines between the points, the, essentially, the kind of... The, that's right, the pathway. Right, right. So, so when you have a pathway to flow and then there is one pressure point or where the acupuncture point is, but yes, it's the connecting dots of all the acu points and then that's the pathway, that's where we call meridian. Apart from meridians, there are smaller branches that can go through all around our body. Probably won't go into that, but yeah. <laughs> okay. In a okay. nutshell. <laughs> If those pathways being blocked and they're not being sufficient flow of chi, you know, around the body can cause all kinds of, you know, internal issues. How do those pathways get blocked? What are some of the common ways that our meridians get blocked? Yeah. So one main thing that I just talked about is the emotion. So when you feel stress, you probably will have some signs and symptoms that show up either through pain. Sometimes the other way we say the liver chi stagnation is you have this weird dull sensation just under your ribs or you sigh a lot. So those are the emotional stress. And then the other things are the food that we eat, of course, and the temperature, the weather changes. Those are also a very main reason. And of course, our lifestyles, that's also a very main reason. So for example, I know a friend's mother, she lived in Australia when I met her and then she moved back to Hong Kong. And then when she went to Hong Kong, I went to visit them. And then she will say, oh, I don't know why, Shirley, since I moved back to here, I have all these pain. And then every morning when I wake up and I need to kind of tap on my lower legs and I feel better. Mm. And then, yeah. So in Chinese medicine, those are blockages. But it's, for me, it very clearly understand where she lives in Melbourne, we have a very dry weather. When she moved back to Hong Kong, it's very humid. And that's the dampness from the environment. Right. So that's why when she wake up, it's always happened when she wake up, because when you sleep, things are not moving well, when you wake up and it's very humid outside and what she need to do is just tap on the muscle. She feel a little bit better. It's kind of helping things to, I mean, those are very simple mild symptoms that she could complain to me. But for me, I immediately know what is the reason, the dampness. I mean, one simple, easy way to look at it is the weather changes. Yeah. And when there are weather changes and then your body will start to react. Ideally, a healthy person able to respond to it. But if there are already some blockages in your body or something is not in a good balance, then you start to see the symptom. So at that point, if you could quickly do some simple prevention, hopefully it won't go further. So with my friend's mom, I mean, she lives in the country. She can't do much from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But there are some herbs that she can use. What she's doing is right. 
every day in the morning when she wake up, tapping on the muscle. If you know the meridian, tap on the meridian will help to move things a little bit. Those are the things that you could do. So those are the main reasons and lifestyle, like what you eat is very important, will affect how those symptoms will arise. And sleeping is very important. So those are all these lifestyles, whether external environment and your own emotional environment. Those are the main four causes, I would say. You mentioned about dampness there and how humidity in the outside environment can actually get into our system and can cause blockages. And then there's Chinese herbs that can expel that dampness from our system. <laughs> the other thing that comes up a lot in Chinese medicine is this concept, you mentioned it earlier as well, of kind of heat and cool. Yeah. And even that there are different kinds of people. Some people are hot people. Some people are cool yeah. people. They run hot or they run cold. How yeah. do you tell, yeah. how do you tell the difference? Yeah. How do I know whether I'm a hot person or a cold? Because, you know, some nights I sweat, other nights I'm really cold, but what's the difference? Yeah. First is, even as a Chinese medicine doctor will ask, do you generally feel cold or do you generally feel warm? So that's the first thing. Some people, they somehow always feel cold and some people, they always feel warm. So that's one simple way. And the other thing is, for example, in Asia, we always say you are a heaty person. Means that whatever you eat, because we see food as warming or cooling too. Some food are categorized as warming food. Some food are categorized as cooling food. So some people, if they have consumed too much of heaty food or warming food, they will start to have the signs and symptoms. Let's say pimples start to show up, mouth also start to calm. And the other way to look at it also, your bowel motion, if you have constipation and whether the pool are very dark color and also very smelly, those are also more warm persons. And some mm -hmm. people, they get angry very easily. And then when they get angry, the color of the face start to show is really red. So that's also another sign. So usually, especially people who live in Asia, they kind of know where their body fit. So they will try to avoid food that will trigger that. Ideally, like curry, spices, barbecue, and those are more warming food. Lamb is another more warming food. So when they eat it, they immediately have the signs and symptoms. Are there other meats that are heaty or warming foods, or is lamb the main one? The lamb is the main one. Okay. It's the very main one. My dad can't eat lamb. When he eats lamb, he will have bloody nose. <laughs> well, it's that immediate. So, I mean, for people who don't have this knowledge, they probably don't know how these things come about, but for a lot of Asian community, even they don't have Chinese medicine understanding, they kind of know their body. I probably can't eat too much of this. And probably when I eat too much of this, I need to drink some cooling tea to cool me down. What are examples of cooling? Because you talked about things like spices, curry, you know, barbecued, or I guess yeah. fried foods. What's on the other end of the spectrum? What are some of the cooling foods? Yeah, so cooling food, for example, let's say I use Malaysia because that's where I come from. It's very simple. In Malaysia, durian. Durian. The, oh, durian. It's durian. Yeah, it's, it's the stinky, it's, the stinky fruit. Stinky, smelly, but some people yeah. love it. It's very heaty. Yeah? yeah. And usually a lot of the time after people eat it, they will drink some coconut water. And coconut water is a tropical country food as well. So I feel that the nature know how to balance it itself. While it produces mm -hmm. the most heaty food, it also produces the most cooling food for us. So durian, I really feel that when we understand the nature, the nature really try to protect us. So that's why you have the durian. And then mangosteen is also in Asia. We say one is the king, one is the queen. And usually you eat them together in terms of, after you eat the durian, I did eat some mangosteen because mangosteen is cooling and coconut water is cooling. And there are herbs that we use in Asia. So there are cooling herbs that we drink. One of them probably is the chrysanthemum flower we drink a lot yeah. when you have a lot of... Chrysanthemum tea, yes. Yeah. yeah, and barley water, it's great for clearing heat. It's also great for clearing dampness. So in Malaysia, you can get this barley drink everywhere. Like when you go to any hawker store, most of them will boil it. And because we know our body and sometimes we do need to take that. So that's... Yeah. Um, mm. Because you talked about some of the signs that you're overly hot, right? That you've been having too much uh, heating food or even emotionally you've been generating a lot of heat. What about if someone is a cold person or on the cool end of the spectrum or has been having too much of the cooling foods and, and you know, fruits and vegetables and things like that? How does that manifest usually? Yeah, usually they feel colder than normal. Even there are warmth in front of them, they probably can't quite feel 
the warmth. And the other way is the color of the face. It's pale and the lips are quite pale. And generally those kind of person, they are quieter. So, I mean, the heaty person, they are louder, they have all this yeah. energy, their anger, <laughs> the fire in the body. But the other type of person, they tend to be a bit quiet. They have less energy to do things. And so those are the signs and symptoms for a colder person. I mean, all these, of course, will change according to the weather and stuff, but there are certain tendencies. So that is the tendency of the colder person. So most of us would orient, we'd orient towards either hot or cold, but as the year goes by, as our life goes by, we may have hotter periods or cooler periods. And we will change. We We will will change change ourselves. We will change. And depending on how we live our life too. So I think the thing about Chinese medicine is, for example, I used to be a hotter person, but I lived in Canada for a few years and Canada, it was way too cold for me. And I feel that I start to drop into that category. So the environment really affecting me. I'm not used to it. And also as we age, we will change too. And our lifestyle, where we live, all will change. So the idea is to pay attention to our body, to learn how to listen to your body, to know what food will help you, what food will trigger certain symptoms and understanding how to find the balance. Yeah. Just knowing whether you're a hot or cold kind of person and knowing the foods that have heating and cooling properties is such important wisdom to have, because like you say, I think in Asia, particularly in East Asia, for most people, it's a given, you just grow up with that knowledge. And and even if it's not something you're interested in, it seeps into your subconscious. (laughs) Yeah. And you keep your parents keep nagging. Don't do this. You will get these. If you do this, you have to drink these and you do (laughs) kind of, you just know. You yeah, just grow so up with, that, with think, that knowledge. So I think, yeah, for those people who don't have this concept, I think, especially if you never heard of it and start to pay attention to what you eat and see whether you manifest a certain type of signs and symptoms. One thing that I recently posted a reel on my Instagram is don't over consume cold raw food or icy drinks. It got a lot of responses. A lot of people ask all these questions, but for Chinese medicine, it's a given. You don't eat a lot of raw cold food. You don't eat a lot of ice. Don't drink a lot of icy drinks because our body, it's warm inside, technically speaking. Our temperature is, you know, 36, 37. Our body is warm. So imagine you dump a lot of cold food in there. It takes extraordinary effort to... To bring it back up. Yeah. To bring it back up to the temperature it needs to be at, right? Yeah. So that's why I see a lot of IBS problem in the West. And when I first moved to Australia, I can't drink cold milk with cold cereal in the morning. I can never eat cold sandwich and I can't really eat a lot of salad. And I think in the West, sometimes when you encourage too much of raw food and then it weakens the digestion in one way or another. So, I mean, some people are strong enough to take it. That's cool. But I feel that a lot of people struggle. And after I posted that reel, a lot of people say, oh, no wonder. I've been drinking this all the time. And then, you know, it's not just a myth. People are experiencing it. So even Robert Djokovic, a few years back when he released his book, he talked about how he changed his diet to mostly warm food based on Chinese medicine theory. And it's actually oh, I didn't know that. It's peak performance. I checked that before I come again. Yeah. I mean, it's something, again, we take for granted. I stopped drinking iced drinks after living in China. And it's funny because whenever I come back Mm. to now I live back in the UK, but whenever I came back to visit, or if I'd be visiting the US, you know, Rebecca has family in the US and we'd go into restaurants and they bring the iced water (laughs) out, you know, (laughs) and we'd say, can we have some warm water, please? And And they'd look at me like, you know, you're not Chinese, but that's usually a request we get from Chinese people. Yeah. Yeah. But of course it's not absolute. Like I say, summertime you can drink some you know, that's fine. You don't have to be absolutely awarded, but just pay attention to find the balance for yourself. Okay. I'm in that same kind of vein. I wouldn't say avoid this or the other, but understand what type of body you have, get in yes. touch with it, and then learn about how what you consume is affecting your body. Yes. That may be different to how it affects someone else. I think that's a really, really good yes, um, because tip. everyone is different. Everyone is different. And as you said, TCM is quite personalized or tailored to the individual. What are some of your other just kind of general health tips, the top tips that you give people in terms of improving health and wealth? Sleep. I think now it's the same Western medicine that to catch up how important sleep is. I will give a very 
very different perspective in terms of Chinese medicine. Sleep before 11 o'clock, mm. if you can. I mean, I'm guilty of it. I'm a bit more active and more productive at night. And that's one of my main struggles myself in terms of I can't sleep before 11. But the reason why we need to sleep before 11 o'clock is just now we talk about the meridians and the flow of the qi. So every two hours, the flow of the qi switch from one pathway or one meridian to the next meridian. Yeah. So from 11 o'clock until one o'clock, it starts to go into meridian called gallbladder. And then from one o'clock until three o'clock, it starts to go into meridian called liver. So gallbladder meridian and liver meridian or gallbladder organ system, Chinese medicine organ system. I don't want you to think of it as a physical gallbladder or the physical liver that we learn from the Western. Okay. System that we classify. Okay. So those two are closely related and liver are very important in terms of the flow of the qi in our body, the stress management, the detoxification. So those are the time when the qi go into those meridians, it would rejuvenate that system or that meridian. So if you are wide awake at night, working like crazy during those times, you are missing on those rejuvenation time. Mm. So if you sleep well before 11, and then you have that complete time for the chi to go to rejuvenate or do what they need to do, repair or to help it, then the next morning when you wake up, you should feel much better. I mean, a lot of Asian people know that. They know if they have late nights, the next morning when they wake up, they feel this kind of warm sensation on the upper body or in the head. So those, we say the liver fire start to come up because it doesn't get the time to rest. And people in Asia, they would know, they know if they sleep late every night for a long period of time, and then they start to feel the warmth in the upper body. So the warmth rising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's one very different from the Western. Yeah. I mean, I try to read more on the Western. It's interesting. I had to see that certain hormone sleep, something to do with stress and all that. The hormones start pulsing out during around that period. And I think that's fascinating. It's actually probably quite related to Chinese medicine. I won't go into it. But oh, no, absolutely. I think it's only now, as you said earlier, that they're starting to converge and these various modalities are coming together. Because at the end of the day, it's sort of different perspectives yeah. on that same truth. So those is sleep. And second is to understand seasonal changes and then okay. prepare for it. Okay. Yeah. So okay. be in tune with the season. I think a lot of the time, or more Western culture is, you know, like, Winter time, I want to go out more and not go against, but they try to live like normal. Mm -hmm. But Chinese medicine is not. Winter time is a time for rest. You rest. You really take the time to rest. We say we live as if you are the sun in a way, because winter time you have a longer night and Mm -hmm. you go to bed early. You sleep when the sun's down, you wake up when the sun's up. Of course, in today's world, when you have to work, we can't do that. But in a general way is to understand the seasonal changes and live like you are the universe. Because winter time is when all the animals and all the trees and all the flowers and all that, they go into the dormant state. And human being, it's also the time for us to rest and be more in tune with ourselves, more go deeper and then have the rest that you need. And then summer, that's when you go out and, and use your energy, just like, Summertime, the flowers blossom. So that's mm. another thing. So learn to live with the rhythm of the universe. Mm. Wow. I love that. So we've got understanding kind of temperatures and your body mm. type, plus the heating and cooling properties of different yeah, foods. Yeah. Sleep, which is something I talk about a lot in the Back to Being program as well. And we actually had a really interesting conversation with a sleep psychologist on mm. one of the other podcasts, Dr. Jade mm. Wu. Shout out to Dr. Wu. It's a really good one. And then the last one is being attuned to seasonal changes and how you should actually perhaps change the way you're living and doing things depending on the season yeah. that it is. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. And then of course the other main one is prevention is always better than cure. You always need to listen to your body. And then when there's little things, and then if you know there are little things that you could do, then if you haven't been sleeping well, I mean, sleep is a main problem in a lot of people's life these days, but don't ignore the problem. Go early and take the action, whatever you could do, however small it is. Food is the same. Just always be very mindful with your body. Don't have the panic understanding oh i have this maybe because i haven't been sleeping well oh i have this maybe i've been eating too much of this food 
oh, I have this maybe because I haven't been able to go to toilet for a while. Those are the small things you can start to take action. But when you don't listen to it, you don't pay attention, it's very easy to slip our mind and slowly snowboarding to something fake. Yeah. So be attuned and be curious about what's going on. And it's a theme that comes up, you know, it's the first part of the back to being course is mindfulness. We talked about this before we started recording and a core part of that is cultivating the mind body connection. I think, yeah. you know, so many of us are disconnected where we live in our minds and we forget that we even have a body, let alone being attuned <laughs> to our bodies. And it keeps coming up again and again in these conversations that I'm having with people. So yeah, mm. cu cultivate the mind body connection and you use the word, be more mindful of your body. Really good. So Shirley, before we wrap up and I want to hear a little bit about you know the work that you do now, where people can find you, but maybe we could just touch on, talked a little bit about pain earlier. I just wanted to touch on inflammation when I get flare ups, which happen from time to time, you know, the inflammation causes a lot of discomfort and then even unrelated to my back, you know, inflammation in other areas is one of the main things that I notice in my body when I'm not feeling well. What's the TCM philosophy around inflammation? How is inflammation treated? Is it different treatments for different parts of the body? It'd be cool if you could talk on that for a little bit. I think inflammation is more a Western concept. <laughs> well, okay. So but when you look at Western medicine, inflammation is not necessarily bad for you. No. Uh, yeah. Inflammation is when your body starts to have some problem, like mild injury, you have uh, bacteria, and then all the inflammatory cells and the white cells and all that come to actually help to protect you. Yes, part of the protection and healing process. Yeah. Yes. And then unfortunately, when our body is overactive, when there's actually no problem, and then those um, start to attack us, that's when it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. But that's more a Western medicine concept in terms of the actual word inflammation in Chinese. We don't have this specific condition called inflammation. The closest that I could think of probably we call is the pain, which is in Chinese medicine, it's called B syndrome. B basically just means kind of pain or things are not moving. So it's back to the, in Chinese medicine, we don't talk about a disease. We talk about signs and symptoms. So like a disease, we will classify this is um, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. We will classify something as female probably endometriosis. But for us, we just look at the signs and symptoms. So okay. if you have this sign, how does it relate? When you have this sign, how does it relate? So even inflammation, they might have different presentation to us and then we might treat it differently. But generally speaking back to the pain concept. So first is to understand whether it's not moving or whether it's not enough nourishment. And then if not moving well, we could use, for example, acupuncture is a faster one to trigger the point and then let it move. Even acupuncture, when you go to see acupuncture, you say you have lower back pain, they probably put a few needles in the lower back and then they put some needles in your legs and then somewhere else. And again, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. where my pain is. It's not because it's all connected. We're using other area to trigger the flow. So it's not just about treating the exact area. So anyway, so if you have like inverted comma inflammation, more a Western concept. But in Chinese medicine, it's not flowing. Then you can use acupuncture or acupressure. Mm -hmm. So you stimulate the moving. Mm -hmm. and then you have mm -hmm. herbs. And then you have herbs. So herbs either to move or to nourish. Acupuncture sometimes can do that. Some needles uh, method are uh, moving, some method are uh, nourishing. So those are the main um, treatment. And of course, I cannot emphasize enough is Tai Chi. We haven't got time to talk about Tai Chi. <laughs> and, oh, that we can do another podcast all about Tai Chi. Yeah. But Tai Chi in terms of that's Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. but Tai Chi in terms of gentle flowing movement. Yeah, we call it mindful movement. So it's also yeah, a key yeah. part of the back to being method is, is exactly. mindful movement. Yeah. yeah. So those are the things that you could do, like Tai Chi or, or, or like your mindful movement or yoga. Those are good in terms of helping you to move. And of course, food. Yeah, and back to food, you need to know what trigger the pain or what trigger. If it's a cold pain, you eat a lot of cold food, then it triggers, then you know. Then you will probably have to eat more warm food during the flare up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. because when you think of it, when something is warm, it helps the movement. Yeah, warm thing will help the movement, cold, stagnate and congeal together. So that's another thing in terms of working out what diet will be better for you. So those are a few steps. And 
of course, the stress management in terms of inflammation, even in the Western medicine, we have to manage our stress. It's triggered the immune system. It triggered the autoimmune system. Yeah, I mean, it's so, so fascinating. <laughs> and it, yeah, I mean, it's a whole different, you said it right at the start of the conversation that it's a different way of thinking. And, you know, in an hour or however long we've been talking, it's, it's, it's only enough time to introduce some of these concepts. Yeah. I mean, you can go so much deeper yeah. in the book, but I can see just from talking to you, it's been really illuminating for me as well, but I can see from talking to you how different it is in terms of approach into, I mean, even you mentioned that Chinese medicine doesn't even label these conditions as diseases. No. It looks at the different signs and symptoms. And yeah. I think that that doesn't work in the Western world because we like to be a bit more, you know, yeah. analytical about it. And it's very nice and clean and tidy to give it this name and then yeah. give it this name and give it this treatment. Despite the fact that, as we've said, you know, every person is different. There is no one size fits all. You've got to find what works for you. And if you're seeing a doctor who's just seeing you as your condition rather than seeing you as a unique individual. So this is somebody with, you know, condition X, therefore they need treatment Y rather than this is person X and they are very different from person Y. And, and so, yeah, it's fascinating. We're going to have to have you back and talk a bit deeper. But now, what are you working on right now? What are you working on at the moment that you're kind of excited about? What, what projects have you got going on at the moment? Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier on, I really want to focus on the preventions and empowering for people because especially currently I want to do more on my YouTube channel. I haven't been very active. I only do one video every couple of months. So I hope to put more effort where I really want to teach people how to do all these little things in everyday life. And so that's where my main platform is that I would like to focus on, on a wider range. I previously have developed an online course. And so that's been going well. And I, what really inspired me is the people that I met through the course, the students. I have people from all around the world with very different backgrounds. Some are, have already strong Chinese backgrounds. Some probably have none, but they're so curious. They really, really want to learn. So that's really inspired me a lot. What do people learn on the course? Could you share a little bit more about that for people that might be interested? Yeah. So the course is a six week course. In the first couple of weeks, I will teach the basics of traditional Chinese principle. So what is yin and yang, what is the coal, what is the five element and what are the dampness and all that. And then later on, I teach on herbs and then I teach them how to use herbs as herbal tea and herbal soup. And then how we can use that to prevent, to treat minor symptoms and how they can modify the recipe according to their body. Okay. So that's the main thing. And then recently I developing a membership. The membership is to help people who want to implement. Sometimes it's easy that you watch some YouTube and then you do one or two times and then you forgot about it and then you move mm -hmm. on to the next video. Mm -hmm. Or some student might get inspired in that four to six weeks. And then later on, when life gets busy, you probably also back to your normal. So the membership is to give that community like support. And then there are database in there. There are once a month Q&A with me that I wish to slowly help people to build that kind of awareness and really build into our everyday healthy habits rather than just something we get excited about for a couple of months. And then we stick back to our own old habits. So now the membership is for that purpose. Yeah, that's and really cool. And that's also at ChineseHerbalPantry.com. People can find out about the membership yeah, there. Yes, yeah. that's right. They can find out there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the YouTube channel is also called Chinese oh, Herbal Pantry. Chinese yes. Herbal Pantry. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. We'll put links. We'll put links to all of these in the show notes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think those are my passion at the moment. I really want to do that. And I think a lot of people who don't have Chinese medicine background. Yeah. So I really want to also support this group of people that there are ways to learn and to do it in a very simple, not complex or difficult way. Yeah. Oh, that was fantastic. And, and I think, you know, I can hear from talking to you and then I've seen several of your videos on YouTube. They're great, <laughs> but you're very passionate about it. But beyond the passion is the intention is there to serve others. And this is another theme that keeps coming up again and again. You want to evangelize and you want to democratize access to this knowledge and, yeah. and, and everyone do it. So I think it's such a noble, you know, purpose. Yeah. And, and I think because of that intention being pure, it's going to be a great success. I know it already is. The YouTube channel's already pretty successful, but it's only going to grow from here. So 
Shirley, thank you so much. I mean, we scratched the surface on all of this stuff, but I hope it's piqued people's interest and they can go and, and do their own discovery and learn more about traditional Chinese medicine. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. It's, it's been great. No, no, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm really excited about I have this opportunity to share. I hope I didn't talk too much. <laughs> that's the point. That's the point of the podcast. That's the point. Okay. Thank you thanks. so much. Thank you. And thanks everyone for listening. Thanks again for listening to the Back to Being podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe to receive news about future shows. If you're struggling with lower back pain and the distress it can cause, then check out the Back to Being method, a 10-week program based on my own lived experience designed to help you transform your relationship with lower back pain so you can live a healthier, more active, and mindful life. Until next time, be kind to yourself and others. I wish you well.